Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy Dave. I'm back in the flesh for another legendary video. Appreciate you guys coming through on this following Sunday evening. Much love and respect to me, you guys. And more importantly, to my subscribers, we're on the road to 4,000 subscribers as we continue to keep everything nitty gritty, everything so saucy, and keep things true, pure, and more importantly, honest when it comes to my opinion. More importantly, getting these results out to you guys. If you have not checked out the show for professional wrestling, or any updated news stories that's coming towards you out there in the world. More importantly, let's go ahead and get into this in-depth full gear review as they were live in Newark, New Jersey, um, kicking things off with Dynamite's Zero Hour with a full stack car when it came to everything that took place. More importantly, started off things with the panel of Renee Paquette with RJ City, Jeff Jarrett, and as well as Paul Walter, who was there to give a critique in honest opinion when it came to everything that was breaking down, not only for the full main card, but as well as for Zero Hour. We had the Zero Hour quick results for you guys as we get things underway. We had the women's action for Zero Hour as we end up having a big victory as we had Anna J. She's wrecking up the wins as she defeated Deanna Peraza with the mousetrap to secure the victory. I don't know what the direction they're going with Deanna Peraza after she had her loss against Tony Storm. Ever since then, she has lost her full momentum, and she has just fought the trails. More importantly, she lost her identity, and she's just lost herself. I don't know what AEW is doing creative with her, but I feel like they really have lost that point of doing something good with Deanna Perazzo. Same with Taya Valkyrie, her partner, as they formed a union, but they feel like meta best. They're under the undercar right now, and they're just losing – like their Lady Frost or Queen Anamata out there. And I'm not feeling it whatsoever. Hopefully they got some changes up for them, ladies, and get them back on the momentum of getting some wins on an AEW roster or make the switch for them to be on Ring of Honor. But Anna J, she's killing it. I love her new ring gear. Uh, more importantly, she had a couple of botches, but more importantly, she held her own. And she's looking good right now being a face, a part of the division for AEW. And I'd love to see what direction she goes with herself. I know a lot of people are like, man, Jack Perry is lucky. But more importantly, the AEW fans are lucky because they're getting Jack Perry not only elevating himself as well as Anna Jay, who has been doing nothing but killing it on the women's scene. She's getting her in ring time when it comes to the square circle. More importantly, she's doing what she can to keep us entertained. She's in the mid-card division. I see her rocking it for the TBS Championship in the near future for 2025. I'm going to put my hat on it. I think she will become a champion and show us what she's made of. And hopefully Tony Khan has dropped the ball on that when it comes to Anna J. But congratulations for picking up the victory. And we shall see how things head to a full steam for next year for 2025. Then we get to the next match. It was a fatal four-way. Buddy Matthews defeated the likes of Commander Dante Martin and Beast Mortis in a great match after to seal in the victory with a curve stomp. More importantly, this match was awesome. They gave us everything that we could have asked for. More importantly, the match was a lot of transitional moves, a lot of back and forth. Everybody was able to hit off their signature moves, and the fans were glued to their seat when it came to that actual match. I love the direction they're going. Buddy Matthews, hopefully they give him a run for the singles title GOAT, maybe go for that international championship. And I think that'll be the great direction. Let's see what he can do against Kateshka. I think that'll be something interesting to see to see Buddy Matthew stepping it up in a singles division. Then we had AJ Boom along with Big Justice and Rizzler. They defeated QT Marshall. This was a social media stunt, but more importantly, an entertainment one at the end of it. We saw Aaron Solo making his return or line back with QT Marshall. But the boom one pretty much got sealed the deal with the power bomb and secured that victory with the one, two, three over QT Marshall, which is a solid victory. And we also had the special guest commentator. We had Paul White out there, still looking like he's still suffering from the hip issue, but he's healing on right on time to, for him to make his initial return back to the square circle, or maybe he'll officially be retiring. But I know he's taking a lot of bumps and roads, and you can sit there and say hey, wrestling's fake. But look at the legends and see how banged up they are, how many surgeries they go through, and they don't be the same after they put their test of time of being in that ring and 
that mat is unforgiving. When you go out there and bruise your body and beat your body down to entertain people for the best comedy or more importantly for the best entertainment to keep us going and loving professional wrestling. We had a vignette from Camille and Mercedes Monnier. Mercedes pretty much let Camille know she her service was not going to be needed for the championship match in the main card. And she's going to have her sit back. And she was disappointed in berating her majority of the time. I don't like the direction they're going with the brick house. She deserves so much more. More importantly, Mercedes still steamrolling with the momentum going into full gear. As her toughest test is going to be Chris Stadlander. When it comes to everything that took place with Camille, Camille needs to find her niche and find things that initially works for her. But I feel like the way that it got her character going, I'm not feeling it. It's not her. It's not her style. The way how she was dominating NWA, they need to go back to that momentum of being Camille and have her be a true powerhouse. Maybe they'll have a blind mixed blind tag, not only for the men's division, but the women's division. I would love to see her tag team up with Chris Stylander and kind of like be like a black tag, a blind tag team, and kind of go at it and kind of just mix it up for a tag team action. I know eventually AEW is looking to debut AEW Women's Tag Team Championships. I can know from you guys' standpoint of view, do you think it's needed? I know WWE and AEW both have their respective championships, a lot of gold, a lot of different things going on. But more importantly, AEW is trying to pick it up and get the momentum going. I know a lot of people are like, hey, this company is trash or the storylines is not good at all. From my personal opinion, the storylines are just not good. But the in-ring action always tells a story of you know you're not going to be disappointed with the men and women that put their bodies online, do their thing, and entertain us. But the lack in depth is the storylines. It's killing us 100%. And I'm not feeling the direction that they're going with the storylines. They need to get their fans a little bit more rowdy up, more entertained. I feel like day by day, Tony Khan is losing the audience appeal. As WWE is steamrolling and pretty much keeping everybody in their seats and everybody's full selling out, selling out the actual venues. AEW got to find their new peak. It's going to take some time. But the thing about it, Tony Khan got the momentum going to 2025 as it's going to bring more eyes as they switch over to Max and be simultaneously um, have their videos being shown not only on AEW, but on TBS and TNT on a regular basis. More importantly, have their pay-per-views aligned on Max, and on top of that, on the other networks they decide to work with, include pay-per-view TV or FIFO or wherever other venues come along the lines of working with AEW. Do we get ready for the main card of the night? We switch gears. When do we get to private party? Does everybody love the shots? More importantly, we love how they keep things rolling. We had tag team action as they had Mark Quinn and Isaiah Cassidy, the tag team champions, defending the gold against the outrunners of Turbo Floyd, Truth Magnum, the Kings of the Black Throne members of Malachi Black and Brody King, their claim of Max Caster and Anthony Bowens. It was a lot that was going on, a lot of chemistry, a lot of back and forth. More importantly, this tag team match wasn't bad at all. It was good, 100% from everything that took place. The chemistry between the claim is really falling off. I don't think they need to break up. I see the direction they're going of making animosity after Max Castro got that business card and Anthony Bowens, and then they're kind of deciding where they're going. But Tony Khan, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. This could be like a cancel Christmas on his breakup. I don't think they would do well being a single star. They mesh together as what we call the scissor very well together of being a tag team. And you need to keep them aligned right now for the moment until something new comes along for them that will work creatively. But keep that claim together. Everybody loves to claim. And I'm one of those guys that enjoy every single aspect moment of what the claim is all about. And more importantly, you can't go wrong when it comes to a claim and daddy ass. But more importantly, Party Party got that victory, secured the victory with that gin and juice. They secured the victory. They got the pinfall for the one, two, three, retained the tag team championship and a great tag team match. Kept us all 
entertain. I thought the Kings of the Black Throne had it in the back because they were dominating the majority of this match. The mixed chemistry of the claim was falling off. The Outrunners are so over right now. The fans love them even if they win or lose. And that's what you want to see when it comes to talent. It don't matter if you win or lose. If they are behind you and you got the momentum and you are still keeping us entertained and you are still getting the bag to the money, do your thing and get around that bag up. You don't need the championships. You can make your money without the championships. The man makes the championships. And more importantly, they don't need it. They could be um, champions never in AEW and still do their thing. And the fans will be behind the outrunners. Then we get to things of the next following matches. MJF taking on Roderick Strong in a decent match. This was a smash mouth mount. Technical as you possibly can get with everything that took place. MJF controlled majority of the match by injuring Roderick Strong, focusing on the arm and the wrist. More importantly, he was able to secure the victory with the Fujiari armbar and submit Roderick Strong, which was surprising. But these boys put on a clinic, a lot of back and forth, and I loved every minute of it. The post-match is where things got interesting when MJF was about to put the attack again on Roderick Strong. Of course, Adam Cole came down. More importantly, the Undisputed Kingdom came down as well. And where things really broke down is where Kyle O'Reilly came down. He got frustrated with the situation that was going on. Adam Cole was calm, cool, and collective, just focused on the MJF. And Kyle O'Reilly pushed him down. And then his frustration said, it was all your fault. You caused this problem, and I'm not feeling it whatsoever. So are we going to see the tensions of Kyle O'Reilly end up having a match against Adam Cole, the boil over, and the MJF is just going to enjoy it and bask in his glory and enjoy how things have taken a shift and a boiling point among the Undisputed Kingdom. Then we get to the TBS championship of the women's division. Mercedes Monet, you got to love her for who she is as she continues to keep us with that CEO. But more importantly, she had it tough as she took on Chris Steinlander in a decent, great women's match. I could say 100% this is probably one of the better matches Mercedes Monet have put on. 100%. This is all the way down to the match she had with Willow at um, Double or Nothing. I think this is probably up there top that. This is a great chemistry between Chris Steinlander. She held her own. More importantly, it was awesome all the way through to the beginning, to the end. And this time around, Mercedes wasn't fumbling around with her wig. But more importantly, she was focusing on the action. And it was a better outcome when it came to how things were meshing together. And we're having the whiny heel and the confident baby face. But more importantly, Mercedes Monet secured the victory by hitting that Casordo into the ropes, securing the pinfall. She had multiple times trying to hit their bank statement or the money maker, but Chris was kicking out every single moment. But it was a great one with an interesting ending, and Mercedes showed and proved herself. Now, who's the next final lady to step up to Mercedes? Only time will tell when we see how things continue to push off. Then we get to the next match of this one was good as you possibly can get. Hangman Adam P Page versus Jay White. This match was everything you could have asked for with the technical wrestling, the suplexes, the signature moves, the back and forth, the hard spots. They gave us everything that we really deserve in this match. This match wasn't a sleeper. More importantly, they kept us entertained. Hope they did too with you guys. More importantly, it was a great one when it came to everything that took place, including Jay White winning with that Blade Runner and securing the victory for the 1-2-3, which was so nice and beautiful of that connection. And then where things broke down was the post-match after he was working his way up the, up the ramp, being helped out with the staff there. Christopher Daniels came up the ramp. Adam Page took a vet, uh, advantage of the situation. He attacked Jay White. More importantly, he even attacked Christopher Daniels. 
and venting in frustration. The gimmick he's got now, he's racking up too many L's, and he lost the momentum after he had faced Swerve Strickland in that brutal steel cage match. And now he's racking up L's every single week. The promos are always good. The vignettes are always on point. But he's, he's looking now. I want him to go back to the Cowboy shit. Even the fans were chanting, chanting. They were chanting the Cowboy shit. That's what they originally want. This gimmick of acting like a madman ain't working out. I want the, the original Cowboy to come back and entertain us, become the top guy, and be one of the top pillars in AEW. And show what he's made of. Tony gone. Make the switch. Turn it off. It's not working for us. Then we get over to the celebration of Mina Shakara celebrating the AEW Women's Champion, Mariah May. They did their own stitch. They appeared on a ramp celebrating, having champagne bottles, portraits all over the place. The whole setup was nice. They sip the champagne and congratulate um, Mariah May with the victory over the coming months and now, you know, celebration where things took a turn was Mariah May is paying the playing at fiddle. It was about the backstab Mina. Mina seen it coming. She ducked the bottle, which Mariah May had in her hand, and things took a turn when she kicked it out of her hand. And speared her off the ramp into the tables down below. It looked like Mariah took a hard bump, bumped her head directly off onto the hard floor. And of course, where things got done was with a seal of the kiss. I think Mina probably chipped the tooth or bust her lip or bit her lip. And so she kissed um Mariah May on her forehead with all the blood from coming from her mouth. And left on her own accord as Mariah was down, battered, and bruised. After she's been getting beaten left to right, had a black eye, the whole nine yards. It's going to be look good. I look forward towards these former best friends. Get it on when it comes to the next following pay-per-view. Either most likely winner is coming or battle of the belts. Then we get to the tag team match. Not tag team, but the TNT Championship. Jack Perry. Defending against Daniel Garcia. Everybody loves Garcia. It was his hometown. This is a true homecoming as you possibly can get. It was a hostile crowd. Jack Perry held his own too. He was a great, phenomenal champion all the way down to the end when he tapped out to the Dragon Tamer. And this match was good. It was good as you possibly can get. And you left nothing unturned when it came to Daniel Garcia as he became a new TNT champion. Congratulations to you, my brother. It's a long time coming. You hanged in there in the fight since the beginning. And you are now the inaugural TNT champion. Well deserved for you to pick up the victory, secure the victory, and stand on your own as the new man of the TNT championship. I wonder if you're going to get your own respective goat, your own design, or you're going to go back to the original red and black with the gold um, TNT logo. But I would love for you to have your own stuff. You deserve it. You worked so hard in that square circle to get to your point and now getting your own first singles goat in AEW and as well deserve. Then we get to the big match. Will Ospreay. Taking on Kyle Fletcher, the Proto Star, versus the Aerial Assassin. This match was off the hook, off the rip. It delivered on everything that you possibly can get when it came to a match. From the beginning of the bell to the end of the bell. From that tombstone to the steel steps, Making things looking brutal, all the way down to the brain buster off the top of the ropes and then hitting it on that top turnbuckle. All the spots, the dives, the corkscrews, everything that came across to this match, you got it. Even spots of them basically count each other. Some moves they were just getting out of, like it was nothing but hot kicks. On a sunny day. 
More than poorly, this match was good off the rip, and I enjoyed it. Kyle Fletcher was able to get the victory over Will Osprey to secure himself to be out of the shadow. More importantly, become a true king and crown himself to be a single star. Where things get all interesting was towards the end, Mark Davis came down to check on Will Ospreay, and Kyle Fletcher looked on and told him he needs to break out on his own and come join the family. But we shall see what happens in that situation. Are we going to get that match soon next? Where does Will Ospreay go from here? How is his neck doing? He took, he sold his butt off in his match, and this is one of those top matches that really delivered in 2024. And I give my props to Kyle Fletcher and Will Ospreay for putting on a great match. Then we get to Koneska Tatesha versus Ricochet for the AEW International Championship. This match was okay, mid at best. But overall, great action. I feel like Ricochet is into his bag of tricks. Koneska Takeshi was countering everything with his strength and power. More importantly, keeping us entertained as well. But the downside of it, Ricochet came off with the loss as the man of the hour. Koteska, pick up the victory from my avalanche broken arrow ricochet got taken down the majority of the match the Takeshi controlled majority of the momentum working on a couple of injuries to the leg in the back and making sure that ricochet couldn't do too much in his match and he got the job done then we get to the next match that people were chiming at the bits about we had bobby lashley the almighty Bobby Lashley with MVP and Sean Benjamin taking on Swerve Strickland. If you got a swerve, you got a drive, and please don't lose your mind. But more importantly, it was great for what it was. It was speed versus strength. Swerve held his own. Lashley was looking better than ever through the course of this match. Not even including the outside interference and everything that was happening through the majority of the match. But it kept us captivating. It kept us entertained all the way down until it became a referee stoppage from the hurt lock. It got secured. Things got put into place. Then afterwards, the hurt syndicate put the beat down on Prince Nana. Lashley makes Nana pass out as well from the hurt lock and lay both Swerve and Prince Nana out. I'd like to know what Swerve Strickland is thinking about now. Is he thinking about joining them later? Is he looking to see who can possibly help him in his fight against the hurt syndicate? I think it's so many people that he can turn to. He can turn to people from Ring of Honor that had his back in the past. He could turn to people from his history, like Hangman Adam Page or Leo Rush. But where does Leo go? Is Leo going to join him? Leo's been thinking a lot as well. Max Caster has been thinking a lot. Is he going to be outnumbered? What is really going to be the true telling of how strong the Hurt Syndicate is going to get leading towards 2025? They dominated, and they came to Hurt. They did their thing. They rocked the house, and they left with a purpose. Swerve is now picking up the pieces. He is now, after he lost the Hangman, in that brutal steel cage match, he is 0-3 in his last pay-per-views. I know a lot of people are not going to say he's buried, he's done, he's finished. I think Swerve is good. Swerve is, has been good as possibly as he, as he can be. Nothing left unturned when it comes to Swerve. Swerve really is great. He signed a brand-new contract. 
got a new house, gotten the great storylines, carried the company 2024. 2025 is going to be a, a cakewalk when he's getting the momentum, going back on top again, and doing his thing. Then we get ready for the main event of the night. John Moxley, a company with Marina Shafir, taking on Orange Cassidy in a brutal match from the get-go. Orange Cassidy was trying to make history again, coming off with that momentum of what he did last year at Full Gear to beat John Moxley with the multiple orange punches and was able to secure the victory. But this time around, it was a completely different story. Moxley was better. He was a lot bigger, more calmer. Controlled majority of the match, busted Orange Cassidy open, beat him down from pillar to post, and rained his fists all over that match. Orange Cassidy tried to help come back with the momentum, but he just couldn't hold on too much longer. Where things got interesting, we had the interference of the Death Riders and the commemoration. More importantly, it was a lot of back and forth. The briefcase even got involved with the title inside. Orange Cassie used that to advantage, but it still wasn't enough. A lot of near falls, a lot of drama going through the course of this event. But John Moxley came out victorious with that devastating Death Rider to secure the victory with the one, two, and three. Where things got interesting was after everything broke down with the whole entire fight. Things really broke down. We had a Christian Cage coming out there. We had Hangman Adam Page get out there. People were chanting, this is awesome. When Moxley and Hangman had a face-to-face -face off, maybe Cowboy shit is officially back. But things broke down in the quickness. Christian was teasing the cash-in with the contract. Jay White cost him that. So it's still there. It's still pending. Then the Death Rider was able to escape of John Moxie with the rest of them as things broke down. They was getting ready to head to that pickup truck. But out of nowhere, Darby Allen crashes the car, tears it up from pillar to post. They jacked the valet guy's keys, hopped in another SUV, and took off. Darby Allen is the next man to step up. Do I think he'll be the one to pretty much secure everything of AEW? 100% on the nose. That ended the broadcast with that situation, but more importantly, the investment of this storyline continues to keep me interested. I like to see where things continue to pick off with Darby Allen and John Moxley. It's going to be a tough one. But I know Darby Allen may be the one to finally get that victory. I know people keep coming up with their mystery. When is Shane McMahon going to appear? It wasn't going to be tonight. I figure they're going to pin it towards the end of the last pay-per-view of the year. Where we're going to get Shane McMahon. They're still taunting things. They're still keeping things in the dark. Where they're going direction with the World Championship. Where Christian's going to fit in. Where Darby's going. Who else is going to step up to Moxley and his crew? What's happening with their claim? They do not need a break up. I'm going to put that on notes. I'm going to put that on notice. Tony Khan, if, if any of you guys from A to be watching it, do not break up the acclaim. What is the direction of the House of Black? They're going to be back in full force as Julie Hart is returning. She's the, she's the bridge line of keeping in all the men in check. And learning from those veterans as well. I look forward to seeing where things go with between her and Jamie Hayter. More importantly, who's the next contender for Mercedes Monet? And on top of that, what is going on with the men's division all around with the international championship? The AEW Continental Classic, which is going to be looking good 100%. With everybody that's going to be involved with the blue and gold side of things. It was announced earlier today about the Continental Classic contenders who are going to be involved. I'm going to have it available in the next following video. 
where I discuss it and talk about everything that comes to promise that every single match is going to deliver where everybody who has been signed up for this match for the Continental Classic. More importantly, if you made it to the end of this video, appreciate you guys. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, or if you're on TikTok, Facebook, don't forget to follow your boy, show some love. And to the next episode, I'll catch you guys later. You guys be safe. I'm out this. Peace.